see a bunch of people interested in historical mapping. So today I'm going to be talking about Wikiwar and what is Wikiwar, where did it come from, and what can you do with it. To understand Wikiwar, it helps a little bit to understand me. Uh, so I'm Bert de Brown. I was seven years in the Canadian Infantry. I studied medieval English and history at Carleton University, and I've been paying the bills by doing Active Directory configuration management for the Defense Department in Canada. I live in Ottawa, Canada, and I'm married with five kids, so I'm busy. <laughs> so what's Wikiwar? Wikiwar is an open data project with the idea of crowdsourcing and then geovisualizing military history. Geovisualizing, what is that? So it's more than just animating, although animating is a big component of it. It's the whole idea of having an interactive map, something you can zoom in and out of, click on map markers, get more information about the units, and more importantly, get a link to all the substantiating documentation. Why is that being depicted that way at that time? It's built with something we call the de facto social research engine. And we picked the name de facto because of this idea of what exists in reality not just what's the official story. So here's me in the early 90s in the army, and my brother came up to me, he was serving as well, and he gave me this book, and he said, Bert, you have to read this book, The Tigers Are Burning. And I'm like, okay, I'll read this book, what's it about? It's about the Battle of Kursk. So hands up, uh, anyone familiar with the Battle of Kursk? A couple of you, okay, that's good. Uh, so for people that aren't familiar with the Battle of Kursk, it wasn't super important other than it was just the largest tank battle in history. So if you didn't raise your hand, you may be a little curious as to why you've never heard of the largest tank battle in history, right? It messed my head up. I'm like, okay, what I'm being told is not really matching up with what I'm reading. Because what I was told is the big battle to worry about World War II is D-Day. And that's the whole reason that we're not speaking German today, right? Anyway. I couldn't do much about this nagging mishmash between what I understood and what was being told around me until in uh, about 2008, I saw this great little clip and it was a animation in Google Earth. It's just a simple hiking path. And I said, whoa, hey, I can write KML. That's not a problem. Now I have a way that I can animate troop movements because if I can just plot their course in, in KML, I can load this up in Google Earth and we'll be, we'll be good to go. So that's what I did. And I went ahead and I got myself a developer and we started work on this demo and it was for the uh, Battle of Crete. And it was a pretty cool demo. I certainly liked it. I thought it was interesting. It gave you a sense of how a battle could play out. It was interactive. You could click on it, find out what the unit was, who commanded it. You could see a list of the resources, like the references as to why that's being depicted that way. And when I was showing it around to people, I said, hey, all you have to do is install Google Earth and you can go ahead and view this. And I just started to watch the eyes glaze over. Install Google Earth, that was just too high a bar for a lot of people, unfortunately. So I'm back to square one. Another problem with having it in that system is that I had basically created a whole pile of data islands. So each battle was self-contained and there was no sharing of information from one battle to the next. What I really wanted was to have a way to have a unit that could be reused for multiple battles and I just didn't have a way to do that. Also, I was a bit early at the game of trying to build this kind of web application, right? Early 2010 timeframe, whole bunch of technologies didn't exist. So we found ourselves building these technologies. Other people were building them at the same time and doing better at it, which we could then adopt, yay. But there's all kinds of ramp up time to take this new technology and incorporate it. But we kept going along. Thankfully, it was around 2012 when I was introduced to Dr. Robert Warren from the Munin Project, and he was the one who introduced me to Open Historical Map. Uh, anyone familiar with Open Historical Map out there? A couple of you, okay, that's good. So Open Historical Map is about historical data, what used to be there. It's built on the exact same tool tech stack as OSM, so that means you can edit it with JOSM, with ID, and 
I thought this would be a great way to have base maps now for Wikiwar animations and, and visualizations. So there's the backstory on Wikiwar and how it came into being. So now I think it's time to charge ahead with the Battle of Gettysburg and specifically Pickett's Charge. So for those of you not familiar, it was uh, the turning point of the US Civil War. And here's what the current OSM map looks like. And as you can see, it's got all kinds of battle monuments and a cyclorama drive and a nice parking lot and walking trails, all kinds of stuff that just didn't exist in 1863. So how do we go about creating an OHM map? Well, I thought, how about I go back right to the, the earliest map and it turns out that there is actually one that was published in 1863, the same year of the battle. And I thought, great, this is going to be accurate. The problem is that this map was never designed to be realistically representational of the ground. So I couldn't rectify it. It didn't matter what I did. So I had to start look around for something else. That brought me to the US Civil War Trust website. And they've got some tremendous maps. And as you can see, they're done with modern GIS tools. Uh, however, their reprint policy and tracing policy are not really friendly and when another gentleman from the uh, open historical map community reached out to them about getting this map data in OHM, uh, they were not supportive at all. So time to start looking around some more. And that brought me to West Point Military Academy. And when I spoke to the chief cartographer there, he was very supportive of getting their campaign data into OHM. Great, so that helped me to build the OHM map of Gettysburg. And as you can see, no more monuments, a whole pile of stuff that uh, even the railroad wasn't even, it was only partially built then. So now what story are we gonna tell about Gettysburg? And I thought one interesting part to focus on is just what did that charge look like? What did Pickett's charge look like? So here we have like a fish hook kind of thing, but I thought, okay, I wanna see the actual units. What does that look like with them in there? So here's a Wikipedia map, which it, the nice thing here is it actually lists all the units. So I had this that I could then take into Wikiwar and I had to build an order of battle. So, cause I needed global unique identifiers and, they, and I had to have a way to represent them. So that's what we did. And as you can see, it's a pretty extensive uh, order of battle for Gettysburg. And this is by no means exhaustive. There's a heck of a lot more data that could go in here, but it's, good, it's gonna be good enough for Pickett's charge. Then we had to trace where the units were and where they went. And this is what Pickett's charge can look like when you have all the units mapped. You have an actual uh, identifier for them. So it sort of, ch it changes things to have a flat map and then to actually watch it animated. And here again, you can see, you can hover over units and find out who, which unit they were. Okay, enough with that century. Let's go over the top now with uh, the World War I battle. And this is the Battle of Vimy Ridge in uh, Easter weekend, 1917, in Northwest France. So it was very important for Canadians for a pile of reasons. The biggest one being that it was the first time that the four divisions of the Canadian Corps fought at, as one. It was very costly, 10,000 plus casualties, dead and wounded, and it was already a graveyard. The French had lost 100,000 troops, dead and wounded, in trying to take this ridge in previous battles, and most of those bodies were still sitting there out on the battlefield, and the Canadians had to fight through them. At the end of the war, the French donated 250 acres to Canada, and Canada built this big monument there. It's over 100 feet high. And for now, I'm just going to gloss over the fact that uh, Canada committed an atrocity by gassing the Germans. Uh, and I'm not saying that to sort of make light of the fact of that travesty, but basically the whole idea of de facto. And that is what happened, what actually happened in reality, not what's the actual official story. Because uh, you're not going to hear that on Remembrance Day in Canada about, about gassing the Germans. But that's what happened. And uh, maybe during Q&A, someone can remind me a bit about how uh, the whole reason we even have that memorial still today is because of Hitler and the SS. Here's the open street map of Vimy. Very similar to Gettysburg. We've got parking lots and walking paths and, of course, the big memorial. And this is what the open historical map version looks like. We've got really good representation of 
the very intricate trench systems that existed in 1917. Now, a lot of this data came from maps. The, night, the interesting thing about the First World War is because it was largely static for most of it, there was a lot of availability and time to sit there and generate really, really good detailed maps. Uh, and this one is part of Vimy with the trench system. And I'm going to call your attention to two minor things with this map that you can see from the scale. So the scale is it's all in yards. Uh, and the map sheets were in meters. So for anybody who's GIS in the audience, can you maybe see that there might be a bit of a problem where you have the scale in yards and then the map sheets in meters? Uh, and, and that's not latitude and longitude, if you notice. It's uh, meters south and meters, and meters west of something. So that something is the point of origin, which happened to be an observatory in Brussels, which moved three times. So anyway, so what do you do with that? So uh, Dr. Rob Warren, my friend there, he actually built a trench map converter. So once you can actually plot a location of a unit, then you can feed it into the converter and you can get it into a modern projection. So we go to the official history. Uh, this is called the Nicholson map and it lists all the brigades and battalions of the Canadian Corps. And part of the reason this battle was successful is that it, there was an intricate barrage plan for artillery that was plotted out in advance. And it, it was a creeping barrage. So the artillery fell basically right in front of the troops and then it just walked forward. And this is what the barrage map looks like. So for Wikiwar, we get the unit movement from the Nicholson map and then we take the barrage map and plot out what, what the actual uh, bra the artillery barrages look like. And then you can see also we had to include the timing as well. And this is part of what that looks like when it's animated. And when we zoom in, you can actually see them going through the trench system. And clearly the animation is rough. It, there's a lot that can be improved, but I think you get the basic idea of having an animated system where you can watch units progress, see the artillery falling in front, and then them continuing on. And again, you can click or highlight over top of them to get more information about the units. So we have time to jump to one more adventure, and that's the Battle of Crete. That was that same demo that I showed earlier. So this was in uh, 1941, just before the invasion of Russia. It was mostly New Zealanders and Australians defending it. Uh, and the person who planned it, uh, General Student, he later called it the graveyard of the German airborne. They took the island, but at enormous cost. And that was the first and last time in the Second World War that the Germans made mass use of airborne. So for this one, we're just going to use the OSM map of the Malamy sector. And the reason I chose Malamy is because I like to focus on critical decisions in military history. And this was one where the critical decision was to withdraw from the airfield and that wound up costing the New Zealanders the entire position. And that cost the British the entire island. And this is what that map looks like animated. So it's a bit different than the one you saw in Google Earth, but the nice thing about this one is it runs on your phone, it runs on a tablet, runs on your desktop, and all you have to do to look at it is be sent a link. And that's a low enough bar that most people can, can manage and deal with. And there's maybe one more adventure we can talk about, and that's potentially the one that involves you. So we're currently in early alpha trials. So uh, this today is the first time we're opening it up to public access. Uh, maybe you're interested in unit data and unit movement. Uh, perhaps you're just interested in learning a bit more about OHM and how that could fit in. Uh, if you're a developer, we've got a whole pile of uh, issues with OHM that we're looking to solve, uh, like how to deal with uh, source and provenance data. Uh, or maybe you're more interested, if you're a developer, in our de facto social research engine or with uh, MapStream. That's how we generate the animations. There's no doubt in my mind, though, that we can achieve some pretty amazing things. And I'm wondering if anyone has any questions. Yeah? 
feather about his there's going to be a birds of a feather about a <clears throat> historic mapping uh, at three if anybody's interested. Um, Thank you. If, if you can come to that, I be absolutely awesome. will be there. So, question for you: Yes, if you have two battles, yes, that occurred maybe years apart, yes. in the same location, yes, have you encountered that? And if so, how do you resolve that? Sure. So. Uh, couple ways. One is, is time-based. So if they occurred at different times, then that's not a problem at all. Um, the, nice, the interesting thing is to be able to have both of them uh, play potentially side by side. Uh, so one example that we're uh, starting the early planning for is to do Napoleon's invasion of Russia and then Hitler's invasion of Russia and be able to play both of those side by side. So, but that, that's a big project. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and it's probably getting ahead of where you are in the in the project's maturity. But often, in like especially nineteenth century battles, elevation plays a big part in things. So, is that a factor at all in, in kind of how you piece things together, and eventually maybe in visualizations also? It is, and that's part of why we wanted to work with Open Historical Map, which is also, I mean, it's nowhere near as developed as OSM is, uh, but we could potentially do that plus have uh, the topographic history as well. Uh, certainly, Vimy has changed enormously uh, since uh, the, the battle when it occurred in 1917. Yep. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, you mentioned about um, uh, Hitler Memorial. Can you expand on that uh, topic during your uh, talk? Sure. So, <laughs> he's not a plant, really. Um, so the, what happened, of course, is that the Vimy Memorial was created in 1936, and in 1940, Hitler was in France. Uh, and there was all kinds of stories circulating by the Canadian government that the Germans were uh, damaging the memorial. And Hitler actually liked the memorial because it was peaceful. It wasn't big stacks of cannonballs or anything of that nature. And he took his whole staff there to show that the, that the memorial was still intact, and then to make sure it stayed preserved, he stationed uh, a unit of the SS for the duration of the war to make sure that nothing happened to the memorial. Because the German uh, Wehrmacht, regular troops, had a real beef against any of the powers that had previously insulted them, like the Australians in World War I. And the Germans actually destroyed every Australian war memorial to World War I. So it was a real, a real issue. So yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, I have a question. I'm really interested in history maps. My favorite of the history, geology, geography, I mentioned, you know, the map animated using which, which software you're working, what software you're working, which software. Yeah, so this is a uh, software that we produced. It's uh, oh. the WikiWar platform is one that we produced. It's ourselves. very different from open street map. It's very different. Uh, yes, it's different, but we because we use uh, open historical map for our base maps, oh, right? Okay. Then we can use that same tool set to create whatever maps we need to. Okay, uh, you working on ArcMap? map? Is the ArcMap map will be co collaboration with Wiki? What you working in? Is the ArcGIS? You working on is the ArcGIS mapping dot web? Yes, that's right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one quick question. Uh, so is there any strategic value to these maps, like from military perspective or like something around that? Like what, what value will it serve from the strategy perspective for future to come? Because this is history we are talking about. Sure, uh, and there's definitely potential for us to go to the English speaking world's military academies. There's about 76 of them. And when this is a bit more mature, that's definitely our plan, is to go to them and, and present them with a tool that could be used, for sure. I, I have one question, if we have time. Uh, we're done with the time, I'm sorry. Okay. We will continue probably on the birds of a feather. I really appreciate your help, and please a big applause for birds. It was great what he did.